What do I think the major flaw was that ship that ship that the ship sank before, before it shipped? Ship. Oh man. I just don't get on my camera. I'm picking it up. Sorry about that. Hi my lovelies, and welcome back to my channel. So, as we know, I'm very passionate about Clone High. Um, I did give you guys most of my unsolicited thoughts and opinions um, in my previous video, but I still do have a ton to say about this show that just would not fit into like one video, even if I tried. And especially now more than ever with the season just now concluding. But when it comes to topics, I think it's only fair we start off by addressing kind of the elephant in the room, and that is Joan of K becoming canon this season. For some background information, Joan of K is the canonical ship name. Yes, I said canonical. Why did I sign my name like that? Joan de Canadark? Who am I anymore? Um, between Joan of Arc Clone of Joan of Arc and JFK, Clone of JFK. Anyway, this was the ship that was really anticipated by a lot of people and expected this season, with it reaching peak popularity amongst the infamous surge of the show that happened in 2020 on TikTok, which ended up prompting the green light of this continuation. However, it's like what me and a lot of people had immediately um, a bone to pick with this season was just how this relationship panned out from start to finish. And this is coming from someone who. I don't even ship them. I, yeah, I can smell the comments. And I'll admit it right now, I was even a bit of a hater at one point, not gonna lie. But I just think it's really clear to anyone with eyes, really, that the way this ship was handled was just very unfortunate all around. And that's why I wanted to dive into it and talk about it in today's video. Now, what do I think the major flaw was that sank the ship before it even sailed? Uh, hmm, maybe um, them dating within the first episode? See, we need to remember that from the clone's perspective, a day hasn't even gone by since Winter Prom Night, so it really made no sense, like, rushing them just straight into the dating stage when they've barely built up the chemistry between the two of them. Like, I think I would have been more inclined to even give them a chance if it was set up properly. Personally, I just see them, I saw them as more of like a platonic relationship, um, and I didn't really think it was necessary for them to date, but if they would have built that up, it would have been a lot different. Plus, I think a lot of people can agree that the chemistry they had once um, during the original show's run, ironically, noticeably, is a completely different energy than when they start dating in season two. It became very clear, at least to me, that it was set up to fail and serve as a learning experience for Joan. Um, after all, this was her first relationship, which could be an excuse for why it was done so badly, but I even think if it was meant to serve as a learning experience for Joan, that it doesn't excuse how horrible it was portrayed, which is what ultimately happens in episode 8 when they officially break up. JFK is just absolutely like hysterical and mess about this, but in episode 7 it's pretty clear what the fate of their relationship is when Joan realizes what she actually wants in a relationship, and within episode 8 realizes she can still have a special place in her heart for JFK while realizing they need to see different people. But let's backtrack to episodes 5 and 6, which honestly pissed me off the most, I'm not gonna lie, but we're gonna be focusing on what's relevant to the conversation we're having today. Basically, Harriet does this musical um, about the game Twister so she can hopefully be scouted out by Hollywood for this contest um, Tropical Hospital is doing, which is like a reality TV show the clones like to watch. So she almost immediately selects Joan and JFK as the leads, since it is a love story, but in the end, after Joan and Harriet just argue a lot, getting the play ultimately shut down by Scudworth, Joan surprises Harriet um, to make it up to her by having the show still go on and be performed at the Grassy Knoll. It's also with this that she endorses Harriet to take on her part in the play, um, left hand on blue, meaning she would have to kiss JFK since it is a love story. Harriet is immediately also like uncomfortable with the idea of this, but Joan, you know, reassures her with this t-shirt and tells her that if anyone were to kiss JFK, she'd want it to be her, which I will just mention is really out of character for Joan if you think back to episode 4 when Cleo like literally held JFK's hand while he was under her spell, she was just visibly uncomfortable immediately. I guess that is a bit different because Cleo is actually JFK's ex, even though like it's never mentioned, just like it's never mentioned that um, Abe is also Cleo's ex. And there's a lot more trauma there too. I think it's weird because Harriet is actually like Joan's best friend, but my mind hasn't like registered that yet just because of how new like Harriet and Frida and like some of these clones are. So 
I guess I should be thinking about it more in the perspective of like, oh, that's her best friend. She thinks she wouldn't do anything to hurt her like that. But most importantly to note, JFK was uncomfortable, which is proof he had like significant character growth from the unloyal womanizer stereotype he took on the season before. That's why this next part is just so angering. Because after they kiss, we get this clip of their hearts being like, whoa. I felt something. And in episode six, JFK ends up cheating on Joan with Harriet. Now you're probably thinking, um, oh, this is when they break up, so tragic. Um, no, it gets worse. They get back together. It's okay. Thank you for being honest with me. But they're really only steady for like one more episode. But you know who gets the short end of the stick though? Words I just never thought I would be saying. Abe Lincoln. <sighs> And I will probably make another video where I go like more into detail on this, but I was literally a full on Abe hater before this season. Like if you told me a year ago I would be saying this right now, I would not believe you. As recent as like, if any of you guys watch Athena P, I submitted Abe as like my most hated character. Like I said, I had never hated a character more than Abe Lincoln. However, he has shown a lot of significant character growth to the point where I can't even help but feel bad for the guy. And hell, I even like him now. But this episode specifically, he is just such a good and loyal friend to Joan. Like, I can see the growth. Um, she wants to specifically keep her silly legs diagnosis a secret, and he doesn't tell anyone, and is by her side the whole time to help her. In the end, he walks in on JFK and Harriet. However, he doesn't tell her, because he feels it could quite literally kill her. But that's so shitty of him, Lula. Why would you- Let's explain what silly legs even is. No! Wait, what is that? Okay, basically, if Joan gets nostalgic, her legs would start to shake, um, all around and in other words, become silly. It's so unserious, okay? But what's important to know is if the nostalgia grows toxic, it could spread to her heart, literally killing her. And in this episode, she's already dangerously nostalgic, leaving her at risk because the grassy knoll got um, burnt down in the musical, like the previous episode. And the whole plot of this episode is that they want to rebuild it to, um, because Joan wants to. They don't know that she's like nostalgic for it and that it could kill her. And Abe didn't know about her silly legs, but they make a blood pact um, after her like doctor's appointment um, to not hide secrets from each other. But Abe still decides it would be best not to tell her even if he wants to because the nostalgia for her relationship with JFK could be extreme enough to kill her and he just can't risk that. However, when JFK and Harriet end up admitting it to Joan, since they realize they immediately don't have feelings for each other, Abe decides to also admit he had a challenging time keeping that from her and is glad she knows now. So, you know what she does? Um, she ends her friendship with Abe, and she continues to date JFK. Are you, Are kidding? you kidding? Oh, you two are <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so essentially the growth that JFK had when it came to being a loyal partner in a relationship was really for nothing, if you think about it, because he just went back to his old ways it makes no sense. And they end up staying together for one more episode because in episode seven, they really come at us full force with this um, Joan of Arc learning from this relationship when she realizes she wants someone who cares to get to know her more like emotionally. So when the desert heat ends up expanding um, JFK's brain, she gets so distraught at the thought of him like returning to his normal self, um, prompting the realization like, oh, oh wow, wow, this wow, really, isn't, really working isn't working for me. For me. Now, who's with me? You better be- And the next episode, we open to a funeral for um, Joan of K. This whole episode is centered on their messy breakup. And I will say I'm obsessed with Shel Silverstein's character design. Like he's so silly. It's not your fault, little man. Your parents love you very much. Just not enough to stay together. And he was totally there the whole time. Also, I can't help to admit the amount of times they use their ship name in this show seriously is really corny. Oh dear, Joan and JFK broke up. What? No, oh, you heard the board? They love Joan FK as a couple. I know they are appealing to the same 2020 type of audience, and that's when this was all written, but I, I can't. Overall, that's how we're left with the state of the relationship, and over the course of episode nine, Joan um, has the realization of, you know, I can still have a place in my heart for JFK, but I don't 
love him like that and this relationship isn't going to work. She also realizes that she really does have feelings for Abe, which is like... Yes, you do. We've known this since season one. I mentioned in my last video um, with episode two, it looks so cool. So huge props to the people who animated that. I just, in the end, don't understand the purpose of having this like as a part of the plot. If it wasn't gonna be brought up, like brought back up again until near the end of the season, we have, you know, she has a sex dream about Abe, but it's like, why did we have this in episode two? And why was this not in like episode six or seven? Specifically episode seven, I think this would have worked. Like she could have had this like dream before she woke up from like the bus crash. It just was obviously out of place because she gets with JFK. She is with JFK in episode two. Um, but she doesn't acknowledge this dream. She kind of just moves on. It's never like, it's actually never mentioned again. Although I said in my last video, they don't touch on it again until episode nine. She doesn't have a realization that she actually likes Abe again until episode nine, but they never touch on the dream again. Even though um, in episode two, Freed and Harriet seem pretty like persistent on the fact that this dream obviously means something. But overall they end up, you know, ending on good terms and JFK ends up kind of rooting for Abe in the finale to confess his feelings for Joan. Although now we don't know where that's going to even go because of the f how the finale ended. I've also never been a fan of like Joan and Abe as a couple, like in theory at all. Um, the only reason I really hated him in season one is because was he obligated to get with Joan? No, but it's the fact that he was just so oblivious. You can't help but be like angered. And it's the fact that he was so persistent on like, Wow, you should get a date for the prom. Like, I need to rewatch season one again before I can like dive into that. But I did want to like briefly mention it because I think a lot of people who um, side with Abe in season one, they're like, well, you guys all think Joan is obligated to have a relationship with Abe. And it's like, that's not really why people are mad at him. He's just like an asshole to her, low key. Not even low key. He's a bad friend to her in that season. Like, I'm, I'm not sorry. <laughs> but in this season, it's cool to see his growth as a character and be like, like, okay, he recognizes even himself that he was wrong for that because he's had this realization of like, oh shit, I actually do like Joan and I've been overlooking her as a friend and a person in general. But that was my thoughts on Joan F.K. Um, in Clone High Season 2. Hope you guys enjoyed and let me know as always in the comments what your opinions on them are and if you ship them or you dislike them as a ship. My next Clone High video essay I do plan to make is going to focus on Joan and how I feel this relationship also derailed her character, which I didn't get too much into in this video, but I did hint this type of thing when I was talking in my other video about how, you know, she suffered big character derailment, like big time. But that's all for today, and I will see you guys in my next video.